Peace and Black Power family, I am here today to do this uh, broadcast. And the reason why I wanted to do it is two-pronged. First, I want to address everybody that been calling me and asking me why I wasn't present at the B1 premiere. Um, several people I encountered throughout the weekend that was in route, people that was there, that was present, was calling me, and um, I purposely avoided some phone calls, and I think I owe it to everybody, because a lot of people had came out because they wanted to support me, as they should. I have people that have been following my journey since Elementary Genocide 1. Nevertheless, um, let me just give a big shout out to Ken Waldo and them brothers from the UNIA the Marcus Garvey organization. Uh, them brothers from the UNIA, they went up there strong and they represented. Um, I was the one that facilitated that and made the phone call for them to come up because I feel that any celebration that deals with Marcus Garvey should include his organization that he led. So I know those brothers was wondering why I wasn't present. Um, and I'm going to get to that. And I apologize to everybody that came out to support and didn't see me there. Now, many of y'all know um, this was a Boyce Watkins and Rick Mathis film, B1. I was, I'm, I am one of the producers. I was the center photographer as well as the editor. Now, me and Rick had a situation where, and I'm not going to get in too much of the particulars of it, we had a situation where he did something that was underhanded. He did something that was grimy. You know, he tried to backdoor me. And I had a conversation with him. I, you know, first I was very respectful. You know, I asked him, um, was he in a position to speak? Because we was talking over the phone. And he said, yeah. And I said, no one was around you, right? He said, no. And we began to speak. And the more that we talked, the more that it was revealed to me what was his intention and his motive, and then he continuously lied to me. And even with me confronting him with his lie, he still went on. And um, I, I came in a cold current, right? Because one thing you ain't gonna do, you ain't gonna play in my face. I don't play those games. So um, I, I'm sure his feelings was hurt, as it should have been, but it, it, it could have went somewhere else, but it didn't. And I kind of let that go, right? Um, that has nothing to do with the premiere. I was scheduled to speak that Saturday. I texted him and pretty much asked him what time Saturday, because I knew Saturday, and the only thing was we wasn't sure on the exact time. We knew, uh, um, he told me from like two to four, but we, I, I, need, I needed to know the exact time I needed to be there. And um, he sent me a text pretty much saying that he is the executive producer of B1, and he's making an executive decision to go in a different direction. In other words, he was telling me that I wasn't going to speak. Now, for whatever reason, he's in his feelings. If that's how he feel, is it right? No. But you know what? I'm cool with that. I don't have to speak. You know what I mean? My work and what I did speaks for itself. I still was going to attend. Um, later on, I found out that... Um, it was being said that if, if I come up there, that they will have security and police on hand. Um, when I heard that, you know what I mean, I'm like, you know what, I'm not even going to go. Um, let me say this, and let me be very clear when I say this, right? I traveled to two different states. Uh, one weekend, I worked 12 hours a day interviewing over 30 people. That was in Orlando. Came back the next year, we did it in uh, Charlotte. Um, I interviewed people here in Atlanta, in my house. I interviewed people in his house. I interviewed at least 90% of those people that you see in that documentary. I spent hundreds of hours doing interviews. I spent thousands of hours editing. And many of y'all are not filmmakers, right? But when you're a filmmaker and you're editing and you use certain risers and background musics and you, and you lay the vocals and you're looking for these sound bites and you're stringing everything together, you know 
that at a certain point, the audience is going to clap. The audience is going to give a response. As a filmmaker, that's the highlight of your career when you're in the audience and you're watching everything play out as you knew it was going to happen when you were sitting there doing these edits. I was denied that. I don't want people to feel like they can't support this film because the film is bigger than this individual, but you need to know who this individual is. And I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. When someone is loyal to you and they show you love and you stab them in the back, that's a heavy price to pay. Not when they gave you a second chance. So my question is to you, Rick Mathis, when a second chance isn't good enough, you tell me when a second chance is not good enough. Because I can tell you this. I work with returning citizens. I work with those that come home from incarceration and is looking to get on with their life because they made a mistake in life, right? So I know what it is to want or need a second chance. I gave that to you, brother. Regardless to what was being said in the community, I gave you that second chance. When I was going to the grocery store, they had a picture up of you. And they was talking about what you did to this black woman in the community that's beloved by the community. When I went to the West End print shop, your picture was there. I called you one day, yo, man, this is crazy, man. What's going on? You remember, it was a short conversation. Yo, brother, I don't know what's going on. Hold your head. The community was in the uproar. You did the right thing. You activated your social media and you got low. You was gone. No one knew where you was for a year and a half. Guess what happened? COVID. COVID was your saving grace. COVID gave you a second chance because the world was mourning the death of loved ones. The world was in turmoil. We didn't know what was going on, what was happening. And you slipped under the radar. You came back. But this time when you came back, guess what? You came to me and said, yo, I'm doing a film with voice walkers, but I ain't, I could really use your help. All right. What you got going on? Me, you, and Terrell, we met. We sat down, we strategized, we talked about what we was going to do. We was excited. We went on, we did some things. The next thing I know, Terrell ain't around. I'm like, what happened to Terrell? But I'll let you tell that story. I don't really know too much that happened, but I know he was as excited as me, and he wasn't around. Yo, I carried you and helped you reach the finish line. You had other people that was helping, that was involved. Whatever they did was minimal compared to what I did. And, and, and you used to try to act like it was you that was doing the editing. It wasn't you, brother. It was not you. I know what your editing looked like. I seen you edit. You had ghost editors. One time you came to my house and showed me something. I said, man, this is crazy, man. Who did this? Oh, man, come on, stop playing. I did. Boy, you don't even do parallel effects. You don't do animation. That's why you hired me. That's why you paid me. You don't do that. Just like you didn't do the editing on Black Friday. Brad Lewis did that. And what you do? You do a Black Friday remix and move this around and move that around and, and took this out, and now you the editor? Come on, man, stop it. Stop it. You ain't who you say you are, man. Where's Dave Anderson at? Where's he at? He was co-producer. He ain't around no more. When we was in uh, Orlando, it wasn't just me. You had the young brother, Tariq. You had the uh, young lady, I think her name was Whitney. You had the brother, his name was Trey. You had Amanda. Where's Amanda at? Amanda was the director's assistant. The first day I went to meet with you and we talked, Amanda was there. Amanda was there when the film was done. We was just shooting extra stuff. And, and I don't even know where Amanda at. Was she at the premiere? Nobody that was there and that stood with you was at the permit. And you're going around and you're telling everybody that you're the documentary king. Yo, let me explain something to y'all family. 
and I'm going to be real with y'all. This man is real deceptive. This man is real deceptive. Remember I told you his picture was up there on the wall. In, 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 in the print shop, in the grocery store, in the supermarket, and everybody in this community that we call the West End, right? And for those that don't know where the West End is at, it's in Atlanta. It's the epic center of black consciousness. This is where I live. This is my playground. Right? And I don't have to walk and look over my shoulders. I am very beloved in this community. But let me get back on point. In this community where his picture was up and around, every place it was, you know what picture's up there now? The picture with him and Boyce Watkins, and it says B1 the movie. That's what's up there now. And he told me that this was his comeback moment. So it's like, y'all thought y'all buried me, but here I am now. I got another movie come out. This is the arrogance of him. And I'm going to show you and tell you even more of arrogance that this man has. We're dealing with someone who got served with two restraining orders. And one day, from two black women in the community, what type of animal are you? When is a second chance not good enough? I'll tell you when, right now. And I don't care what nobody said. I'm telling you it. Maybe there was nobody to stand up before and wanted to be as outspoken as they should be. Well, guess what? I'm that person. Put me in the fire. I'm telling you right now, he gets no more chances. Not in this community and not in no other community. And anybody that gives him a second chance, I'm going to challenge that. He don't get no more breaks over here. I'm telling you that. He gets his breaks on Broadway. No breaks over here. There was times I took pictures with him, and then the whole comment section is filled. And I'm like, yo, man, look, man, you know what I mean? A couple of people, you know, I personally called them because, you know, I'm letting them know, like, yo, what's, what's going on? What's really good? And they was like, yo, you know how it is, Rod, you know, I got love, I got respect for you, but um, listen, man, so on site with, you know, with the homie, I told him that. You know what I mean? Yo, you, you better get in front of this. So, listen, man, I'm going to say this, man, and I'm done. You know, I got a birthday to celebrate. We're going to start early, man. We're going to turn up, right? It's the turn up time. And, I, and I'm not revisiting this unless he responds. This is my solo debut, ladies and gentlemen. And if he responds, I promise you I've got a mixtape coming out. And i got about eight or nine features on it. I promise you that. Let's be clear, family. I want everybody to know I'm not bitter. The reason for me doing this, I wanted the community to know who this man really is. Um, several people, from the time he even entered the documentary game, had issues with him. There's nobody that worked with him that is around. From the first documentary, none of them is around. Brad, Brad Lewis is not around, Dave Anderson is not around, and anybody else that helped him in, certain, in any capacity is no longer around this individual. And the reason why is because he always centers himself. He wants the spotlight, family. Let me, let me tell you something, right? This is a Rick Mathis and Boyce Watkins documentary. Rick, who introduced you to Boyce? You remember when you called me and said Boyce was in town and that if I can introduce you to him? I already had the documentary out. I already had Boyce in my documentary. So what I do, I go and I introduce you to him. Now you cultivated and develop a relationship as you should on your own with him. And, and, and that's cool. But don't forget who made the introduction. Same thing. You called me, yo, uh, where you at? I told you, yo, I'm on my way to go see Umar. He's in town. You ask, could you ride? I said, yo, I'm already in route, but you can meet me up there. You meet me up there, what you do? Yo, Raheem, you think you could uh, ask Umar if he'll be in my documentary? Yeah, brother, sure, no problem. Umar just got off stage. A lot of people was crowded around him. I caught his attention. I said, hey, Umar, real quick, 
It's my man right here. Um, he's doing a documentary. You think you could uh, say a few words on camera for him? Umar took one look at him and said, nah. I said, what happened? He said, yo, how I know he ain't one of my haters? I said, nah, nah, he ain't, he ain't like that. He said, yo, you sure? I said, yo, he works for Rolling Out Magazine. He said, right, you sure? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, all right, give me a few minutes. Came over there and, and, and did the interview. I'm not jealous of you. I don't hate on you. In fact, man, I helped you. I was the center photographer on your first documentary. Let me recall a day I was with Rick Mathis. And this particular day, we seen attorney Mawali Davis. I said, oh, they go Mawali Davis. He said, fuck Mawali Davis. What's going on with that? He said, yo, that situation that I got into, I reached out to him and I wanted him to um, help me get out of jail and to represent me. And he told me he couldn't do it because he knew me as well as her and he didn't want to get involved in it and it was a conflict of interest. You know what Rick just did? Rick just presented him with the Freedom Fighter Award. I want you to tell me, family, and make it make sense. So the person that didn't aid in a bed and help you get your freedom, you gave a Freedom Fighter Award to. Come on. You know why he did it? Because he want to play in this girl's face. He wants to show her that you thought nobody was going to stand by me, but I'm Rick Mathis, the documentary king, and I just presented him with an award. It's all over the internet. I'm back. If you go on her page, you're going to see that she discussed going through those dark and terrible moments, the darkest moments in her life when she was dealing with this unfortunate tragedy that it was through the teachings and the wisdom of Queen of Four that helped her. You know what Rick Mathis did? He just gave Queen of Four the Freedom Fighter Award. He's playing in this woman's face. He's playing in all of our faces. But many of y'all not gonna see that. And let me tell you something, these elders don't even know. Many of them don't even know because they're too busy. We're dealing with a lawyer. He's not on the internet. He doesn't hear the, the gossip, the chatter that goes on in the community. Queen of Four, she does what she does. She doesn't know none of this, but she's going to know the day. Mawali's going to know the day. And you're going to know the day. And I hope that you make the right decision and that you look at him and see him for what he is and not what he presents himself to be. Because he's a detriment to the community. Now, y'all let him back once. I want to see if y'all do it again. There was another incident where I was with a group of sisters and I was hanging out with them. And it was late, late at night. And they decided they wanted to go to a spiritual house. And they said, Raheem, you, sh you should come with us. I said, all right, I'll go. I go to the spiritual house and, you know, everybody introduces themselves. And after introducing ourselves, take a small um, break, an uh, intermission. And one of the elders pulled me to the side and she said, what you said your name was again? I said, Raheem. She said, yeah, that's right. And your last name? I said, she's bad. She said, yeah. My friend Susie, she told me that was your name when I sent her the picture of you. I said, the picture of me? Where did you get a picture of me from? She said, when you were sitting over there, I took a picture of you and sent it to you. And she told me she knows you and um, I was confusing you with someone else, but you're not him. And then while we while, while we're still talking, the lady who house that we at is walking by. She grabs her hand and she said, "I was wrong. This is not who we thought he was. He is a filmmaker. He is from the West End, but he's not that other guy." And you should have seen the relief that was on this lady's face. She was like, "Thank God." When I got out of there, do you know I called him? And I recounted everything that just transpired. And I said, yo, man, you really need to get in front of this, man. I was just almost mistaken for you. 
And I told him, man, there's two things I don't do, man. I don't go back and forth with women, and I don't put my hand on them. And I said, to sit there amongst a group of women, mind you, I'm the only male around 20 females. And it was cool, though, because they made me feel real comfortable, you know, being the only male. They, it, it was all right. They was like, you know what? Today is your lucky day because usually they said that um, it'd be even, male and female. It just so happened that day that, and it was late at night, um, I was the only male. And I didn't have a problem with it, you know. Um, there's so much I could say, man, that I don't want to say. There's stuff that people shared with me in private, and I'm going to allow them to have they say and, 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 and tell their story. I'm done with it. You know, I'm not I'm not putting nobody um, on this platform to come and, 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 and tell their story unless I have to. So you can play these games if you want. Um, I'm done with it. And, and the ball is in your court, playboy. The ball is in your court. Peace and love, black family. I'm out of here.